So today I am in Eastern Europe, in Bucharest, the capital of Romania. A city which in my opinion is one of the coolest cities in Europe and probably one of the coolest cities I've been to in the world. And I was actually here four years ago and I had the time of my life and I finally came back last night. So in this video, I'm going to explore some of the coolest spots in the city and tell you guys some fascinating stories about this city's history. So I was just on one of these trams earlier and it looks so old for a second I thought it might be from like the communist times and then look it up, it's not, it's like 21 years old or something. But the good thing is you can go in and pay with your card so you don't have to get a ticket or pay in cash or go through all that hassle. There's just like this machine where you go and tap your credit card. It's a pretty fascinating system. I actually hadn't seen that anywhere else until I came to Europe this summer. Honestly, not surprised that it's already in Bucharest already because Bucharest is a big tech city. So I got here actually pretty late last night. I think around like 11 p.m. and it was six degrees and this is early October. So it's only gonna get colder as I spend my time in Romania. The first thing you notice when you come here is the amount of graffiti on the streets here. There's like graffiti in every part of the city, at least the parts that I've seen. Then I checked into my Airbnb, which has got like a tiny bed, but is really pretty, has a really pretty balcony, has a really pretty like outdoor area, honestly, that like reminds me of Paris or other like fancy French cities. Right now I'm going to the old town of the city. Speaking of the old town, or the age of this place. The oldest human fossils that have been found in southwestern Romania are actually 35,000 years old. And I think those are some of the oldest Homo sapien fossils that have been found anywhere else in Europe. The modern borders of Romania were actually created after World War II. But like any other country in the Balkan Peninsula, the borders of this nation has changed countless times over the last thousand years because it's always been on the crossroads of very powerful empires on all sides. Okay, so I was trying to go across the highway. It seems like the easiest way to do it is to go through these tunnels underneath the street. And this tunnel in particular has got like some interesting sculptures. I see a Raiffeisen bank over here, which uh, I don't know where this is from, but this is like everyone's favorite bank in Serbia, or all my friends' favorite bank. So I just took out some cash from the ATM because in Eastern European countries, maybe not this one, but usually you need cash to do just about anything else, at least for buying small things from kiosks and stuff. I took out 200 Romanian lews, I believe that's what it's called, and one US dollar is right now equal to 4.7 Romanian lews. So this should be close to like 40 or 50 bucks. I got like a hundred bill. That's a 50 bill, and these are all 10s. Okay, so I'm definitely in the old town right now. See all these like ancient buildings around here. It's mostly like a bunch of shops and a bunch of uh, cafes and restaurants with outside seating. If I remember right from last time, this place really comes alive at night. There's a really cool building in front of me. Some of these streets in Old Town are just so pretty it's already like prettier than probably almost any other city the old town at least is prettier than any other city i've seen in the balkans at least the center of it is really gorgeous there's like these massive buildings with beautiful architecture so like i was saying earlier modern day romania or this territory has been occupied by many different empires over the last couple of thousand years first it was occupied by the roman empire which is why to this day this country probably has the name romania and has a latin language it's i think the fifth latin language the other four are like Spanish Portuguese Italian and French and those four kind of like connected together in Western Europe but in Eastern Europe you have this country called Romania which also has a Latin language after that came the Byzantines and that is arguably why this country is still Christian Orthodox 84% of the people in this country uh, from the last census that I saw are Christian Orthodox and in the middle of Old Town you'll find probably the most gorgeous, in my opinion, Christian Orthodox Church in all of the city. This is the Stavropolios Church. This was built like 300 years ago, back when it was actually under Ottoman occupation, but the population was still like Christian Orthodox at that point. And this is a magnificent church. And there's like a really gorgeous courtyard inside this complex, so it's a lot more than a church. The inside of this church is just as beautiful as the outside. It's like a lot of really pretty frescoes. 
and some very, very beautiful carvings and decorations from the walls to the doors even. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but it looks like they're setting up some kind of like filming set or some stage for a show right next to the monastery. So after the Byzantine Empire fell, this whole area came under the control of the Ottoman Empire that back in the days controlled everything from like North Africa to the Middle East to a big part of the Balkan Peninsula. But not everyone was just happy to like lie down and let the Ottomans take over. There was this one ruler who wanted to fight the Ottomans for every inch of territory that he had. And he is probably the most famous person ever to come out of the borders of modern day Romania. And I'm sure you've heard about him, even if you don't know anything about Romanian history or European history or history in general. I'm, I know you've heard about this guy. But before we talk about him, I want to get some food. So now we're going to try some shawarma, Romanian shawarma. Chicken shawarma, please. Yes. Uh, uh, spicy. Perfect. And uh, uh, everything. Um, no tomatoes. That's the only thing. No tomatoes. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I got a shawarma. I know like Romania is probably not the place that invented shawarma. It's like a Middle Eastern thing. But from my experience in Bangladesh, I know that places that didn't invent the shawarma can still make pretty damn good shawarma. That's like literally what I used to eat every day back when I was in Bangladesh. And my friends from Romania told me that I need to try out this chicken shawarma over here so I didn't eat breakfast and that was a good idea because this thing is so huge there's like so much stuff inside it there's like french fries that I can see there's like pickles there's some spicy sauce uh, there's chicken shawarma obviously there's like all kinds of salad there's onions uh, everything except tomatoes I asked for no tomatoes and apparently this is a really good thing to eat after you party so this thing costs like Total, including the Pepsi, costs like 42 leo, but the shawarma itself costs like 33 leo, which I think is like seven dollars. It's definitely more expensive than like the Middle East or any other shawarma I've had. Mmm. Mmm. It's really nice. It's like definitely a bit drier than I expected with all the sauce given. I guess I didn't take a lot of sauce except for like the, uh, the spicy one. And it's not that spicy by the way. Like every time I hear spicy in Europe, it's usually not spicy. Not always, but usually. And it's the same case. But I'm glad I got all these layers. You can like really taste the french fries and the chicken and all the veggies and the pickles and everything in one bite. It's delicious. I got a bite of some carrots this time. Fresh cold vegetables. For like salad adds like a crispy taste to it too. So I was trying to get a Coke Zero and they said they have a Pepsi Max which I was confused because that's something like Coke Zero. But now that I see on the can it says Zero so I'm guessing this is like a Pepsi's version of Pepsi Zero. Coke Zero. Hi! This kid's looking at me. So to make things more spicy they actually add like these little peppers that you can ask to have. Okay. That food was really hard to finish, but let's go back to talking about the story of Romania. So in the 15th and 16th century, a lot of what is Romania today was conquered by the Ottomans basically. But in the 15th century, there was this ruler of Wallachia, which is a historical region of Romania, still is a region of Romania. Romania as a whole wasn't a country back then, these were all like small kingdoms. So the ruler of Wallachia, Vlad III, or Vlad the Impaler, as he's called, was not ready to go without a fight. In 1453, Sultan Mehmet II, or Mehmet the Conqueror, took over Constantinople. And now he could focus on expanding more westwards, or like asserting more of his dominance to the westward regions that were already under his control. And around the 1450s, 1460s, that's when Vlad the Impaler resisted this uh, foreign excursion, let's say. There were a series of battles that he fought, initially successfully, against the Ottomans, or Mehmet the Conqueror. Eventually, at one point, he tried to like break into his like encampment and tried to kill Mehmet the Conqueror when he was sleeping, when he was least expecting it, but missed him by a little bit. So he eventually failed, and all of this territory actually did come under the Ottomans. But his uh, fight against the Ottomans 
or his fight against foreign imperialism in a sense, made him a Romanian national hero. But there was another thing that he was really, really famous for. It was about the cruelty that he showed to his enemies, both soldiers and civilians. So when Mehmet the Conqueror sent some people to like ask him about why he's not paying taxes, he basically impaled them. That's why he's called Vlad the Impaler, which means you take sort of a stick or a spear, stick it up one side of your body, take it out the other, and then you leave them up for people to see what happens when you mess with you. So Vlad the Impaler was known for torturing, burning, and killing his enemies, including civilians, but he was mostly famous for impaling a lot of people. At one point, when Mehmet the Conqueror was following him, following his tracks, as Vlad the Impaler retreated, he ended up in this forest of bodies where there were like a thousand people on sticks, all of them impaled. Corpses of people that were against Vlad the Impaler. And uh, that really like shook up the Ottoman troops. And even uh, Mehmet the Conqueror to an extent, he had never seen anything like that. They had never seen anything like that. So stories of his cruelty actually like spread all over Europe eventually. And he became known as this like monstrous, cruel human being to the rest of Europe. But to Romania, he was always their defender. A cruel one, but someone who was doing what was necessary to prevent further foreign encroachments. So because of this cruelty, he was often called Vlad Dracula. Does that ring a bell? Dracula, the vampire, that story is actually inspired by this guy to some extent. Vlad the Impaler was so cruel to his enemies that the legend lived on. That's why Count Dracula from the book by Bram Stoker is actually someone that lives in Transylvania, which is in Romania, and is this monster, bloodthirsty monster. Because there's like also rumors that Vlad the Impaler liked to drink the blood of his enemies. All of that part has not been confirmed yet. So I'm in Old Town still, in this place called Kurtia Veke, which means the Old Princely Court. And this was one of the courts of Vlad the Impaler. So Bucharest today is only like 60 kilometers north of the Danube River, which used to be the boundary, the old boundary between the Ottoman Empire and Vlad the Impaler's kingdom. So he had to have a fortress here basically, or a court here, so he could defend the southern boundary. Interestingly enough, the first ever time there's any written mention of the modern city of Bucharest, at least with its current name, was during that time when Vlad the Impaler was here in 1459, when this was his princely court. So the church behind me in Kurtiaveke is called the Kurtiaveke Church, and this is the oldest church in all of Bucharest. And you can actually go inside and see some amazing frescoes, see some amazing architecture, very beautiful lighting. Reminded me to some extent to the other church that we saw earlier. Note that this is not the building in its original form from hundreds of years ago. This has been heavily renovated over the years. Actually right over there on that side, there is a bust of Vlad the Impaler himself with his like mustache and everything. But it seems to be closed right now and they seem to have covered up his face or the bust or the statue with some like cloth and some like wooden planks because it looks like that area is going under some heavy renovation. So in 1859, while this area was still under Ottoman control, the Ottoman principalities of Wallachia that we're just talking about and Moldovia, which is actually the eastern part of Romania today, these two principalities combined to essentially form the modern state of Romania and it changed its name to Romania in 1866. So for a long time, Romania had essentially been caught in all these different battles between the Russian Empire to the north and the east and the Ottoman Empire coming from the south and the territory changed hands a bunch of times. Then in 1877 to 1888, there was one of these wars, like a Russia-Turkish war. This time, they decided to fight on the Russian side against the Ottomans. And when the Russians won this war and beat the Ottomans, that was the first time Romania actually got its independence from the empires around it. And the modern state of independent Romania was created with its own king. So on the edge of Old Town is the street which is probably the most historic street in all of Romania. This was the first ever street to have lighting, which was in 1814 when it was lit by candlelight. And this was the first ever street to be paved in 1842. When the Romanians won the War of Independence, they renamed the street to Victory 
avenue. A lot of novels and a lot of other storybooks written about Romania are probably gonna feature the street right here. There's a lot of important buildings still on the street, like the Romanian Museum of National History, which is on the edge of Old Town. So when you're walking through the street, you're also gonna see a lot of different famous hotels, old hotels, and you'll see a lot of Romanian architecture, which is essentially a blend of different kinds of architecture. Some parts, not a lot, is inspired by Ottomans. There's a lot of like Habsburg architecture throughout Romania. But the most prominent style of architecture that you'll see like in the building behind me is French architecture. There's a huge influence that French architecture had in the building of Bucharest back in the days. That's why it's often called the Paris of the East. Like I mentioned earlier, after Romania got its independence, it was basically a kingdom with a lot of kings. And if you walk all the way up Victory Avenue, you'll come to this place called Revolution Square. You'll also come to the former palace of the royal family. This is where the royal family used to live until uh, after World War II when they were no longer a thing. But Romania had some pretty interesting kings in the meanwhile. The most interesting ones to me was this guy named Carol II. He wasn't a good king but he was like famous as the playboy king and there were multiple instances when he went on vacation with his mistresses off to somewhere and he just was like okay i don't want to be the king for a while you guys take over i'm gonna go on vacation with my ladies or whatever it is but another king that was very popular and was very famous is king ferdinand the unifier and this guy was called king ferdinand the unifier because he was the king of romania after world war one when it ended Romania was on the winning side and it gained a lot of new territories where Romanian speaking people lived. Notably, the biggest acquisition probably was of Transylvania, which was under Hungary until that point because Transylvania to this day still has like a sizable Hungarian speaking minority. But that came under Romania's control and all the people who spoke Romanian were finally united under one kingdom. This is of course no longer the palace of the royal family, this is like the Museum of National Arts right now. So I have to say the metro system in Bucharest is very cool. You just go in and you can buy a ticket the old fashioned way from a machine but you can also just tap your credit card and it charges you three low. And by the way this is a different day. Yesterday my camera died, my battery died and I forgot to bring an extra. So I'm trying to finish off what I started yesterday. So growing up, I used to think only Paris has an Arc de Triomphe, but later I found out even Marseille has one, Barcelona has one, and now Bucharest has one too. So the original Arc de Triomphe in Bucharest was actually built in 1878 after they got independence from the Ottomans, but back then it was just like a simple wooden gate. And then after they won in World War I, a couple of years after that, they ended up renovating it and making it look similar to what it looks like today. Okay, so I'm gonna continue with the story of Romania, but it is a new day and I am hungry. So it's time for me to try some traditional Romanian food from a place that was recommended to me. This is Sarma Luce. Yeah, Sarma Luce. It's chicken rolled in grape. Can I get a cappuccino, like iced cappuccino? Is there a menu for the yeah, drinks? Yeah. Okay, we have Nescafe, Irish coffee if you want. <laughs> not already. Right. Something with liquor. <laughs> no, not right now. Cappuccino, just a normal cup. Thank you. Getting my first cappuccino of the day. I found this really friendly waiting staff from Nepal who also suggested like this uh, mushroom appetizer. So I'm gonna try that as well and see what that's like. That looks pretty nice. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so for the appetizer today, I got this dish, which is called Rasho Vianca Ku Sipurizi. Probably pronouncing that wrong. All it says is it's a traditional Romanian dish. So okay, this is stuffed mushroom with garlic, onions, and cheese, all wrapped in a pancake. Should be pretty delicious. Mmm, heavy. All the mushroom came out in the first bite. It's gonna be very cheesy and very heavy. Oh man. It really doesn't taste like anything else I've ever tasted before. Not sure if I'm gonna have space for the main dish after I eat this. It is a lot of cheese. 
managed to finish the appetizer. Now time for the next round. Okay. So I got this thing called sarma luce. Now sarmale is the traditional Romanian dish, which is basically like cabbage rolls with like pork and I think other kinds of beef inside it. It depends on where you get. They change it up a little bit in Romania. But I got sarma luce, which is basically chicken. I think it's boiled chicken wrapped with like grape leaves. And it comes with polenta, which is basically this like carby porridge made out of fine corn which is like a replacement for uh, bread, like a gluten-free version of pasta in a lot of places, in northern Italy at least. And it came with a big-ass pepper. And they give some like cream on top of it, cream fraiche, which is basically like, I think 40% like butter fat and stuff like that. Should be pretty good. Not that hungry, but should be pretty good. And the sarmale, that is the most common dish, is usually very similar to the sarma that you can find in the Balkans, in other places in the Balkans, like Bosnia. Okay, time to try it out. First one. Mm. Really nice. Looks exactly like sarma from what I remember. Really nice. This is not spicy at all. And to try the corn porridge stuff. Pretty bland. I guess you're mainly just supposed to eat it after a bite of this. But if you're like me, don't eat this after you have a huge appetizer because this is so filling and I'm already full. How's it? Uh, it's pretty nice. Good. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. You're liking it? I'm liking it, but I'm also like a little right. full. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that was an amazing meal with appetizers and uh, a full course meal, which is like 100 leo together, which is I think a bit more than like $20, like $22 or something like that. And then I added like a 15% tip. Very delicious, but do come here only if you're really hungry, if you're gonna get an appetizer. <laughs> We're running out of daylight today because this is Europe in mid-October. There's not a lot of light like the summer anymore. So I'm just gonna continue the story as we go to the next spot. I'm gonna make a separate video about communism in Romania and the fate of their dictator because that's the part that I really know by heart and it's like a really interesting story. And I think it's very hard to understand the lives of modern day Romanians and just everything else over here without understanding the things that went through through communism till not that long ago. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about that one in this video as well. World War One was great for the Romanians. The outcome was at least really great. I mean, a lot of people died, but they got a much bigger uh, country than they had before and was cause for celebration. World War II, not so much. So they initially joined World War II on the side of the Nazis, on the side of the Axis powers. And then before the end, like a year before it ended, they ended up switching sides to join the Allies. So they technically did win World War II, although they had to like pay uh, reparations to the Soviet Union because of the damage they did when they like went into battle. But there was this very important meeting in 1944, which is called the Moscow Conference. Stalin was there, and so was Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the UK at the time. FDR, the US President, wasn't there himself, but whatever decisions Winston Churchill was making, he was getting a lot of feedback from the US, so he was doing what was in the best interests of like basically all the superpowers in the Allies. Because they were fighting together on the same side in World War II, Soviet Union, US and the UK, and the France and the Western people, but they were not really of the same ideology. They had very different ways of how they wanted to run the world. One was communist, one was free market capitalist. So they were basically meeting to decide who will get to control or who will get to influence the different countries in Eastern Europe after the war is over. Because by October 1944, it was very obvious that they were going to win the war, the Nazis were going to lose, and they're going to decide how they're going to run this place. So there was like a lot of negotiations basically going on on uh, who gets to control what. Some cops in front of me, so I'll just stop filming for a sec. Okay, so while these negotiations were going on, Winston Churchill basically passed a piece of paper to Stalin as his proposal. And in this piece of paper, he had written out like how much influence the West versus the Soviet Union would have on these countries. And he wrote it as percentages. On this piece of paper, he basically said that the Soviet Union was gonna have 90% influence on uh, Romania after the war, assuming they win. Stalin looked at it for a while and he was like, okay. So in that moment, essentially, Stalin and Churchill decided for the people of Romania, who's gonna rule them after the war is over. And the people of Romania had no chance to have a say in this. And they were doomed to a communist future. So when the war ended, the Cold War began, the USSR backed the communist party that was uh, trying to take power in Romania 
although the people at the time were not pro-communist at all. But because of this Soviet backing, which was like too big of a superpower to disagree with in Romania's case, which is like a small country, they ended up controlling Romania and they became the only party in charge of Romania, trying to apply laws that benefit the Soviet Union, honestly, more than they did Romania, because this became a bit of a puppet state. And the first dictator that came into power is Georgi Georgiodes, and he was in power till like 1965 till he died. He was heavily criticized at one point because he had all these policies that basically allowed the Soviet Union to like loot Romania of its wealth. But then the guy that came after him was called Nicolae Ceausescu. At first he was like popular because he was against a Soviet interference in Romanian policies. And when the Soviet Union actually like invaded Czechoslovakia back in like 1968, he heavily condemned that and publicly condemned that. And that made him a very popular figure at the beginning of his like reign, let's say. But then he started becoming unhinged and he started doing crazy totalitarian things that a lot of dictators do. And uh, that's where the bad part started. So right now I'm in front of this building called the Palace of the Parliament in Bucharest, which is one of the largest buildings in the whole world. It's uh, supposed to be the heaviest building in the whole world. I think it's the second biggest government building anywhere in the world after the Pentagon. And this building, in a nutshell, symbolizes everything that was wrong with uh, Ceausescu and his brand of communism. So in 1971, Ceausescu went on this tour of other communist countries in Asia. He went to North Korea and he went to China. He saw how much the people seemed to love Mao and Kim Il-sung in North Korea and how they were like putting up all these celebrations for him and he was amazed and he was inspired and he wanted to come back and he wanted to get the same thing for himself. So he changed up the whole country's policy and developed his own cult of personality similar to the ones that Mao and Kim Il-sung had in North Korea and he decided to like start indoctrinating kids at a very young age about loving the state, loving him, loving his wife, basically the royal family essentially although they were not royalty. In order to make a symbol for his rule. He wanted to make the biggest building ever. He wanted to make the grandest city center ever. And he wanted to do that right here where the palace of the parliament is. But the problem was, there was already a city here. There were people living here. There were 30,000 people that were living in this area where you see this. So what was his solution to that? He decided to relocate everyone and destroy all the buildings. Entire historic neighborhoods were destroyed just so he could have space for his dream project. And this was an uneducated guy. He didn't even like finish high school from what I remember. So obviously this guy was not the best architect. So the construction of these buildings actually took like decades. It wasn't even completed till like I think eight years after he died. And while this was being constructed, he was spending four billion euros into constructing all of this while the country was starving because they didn't have money. And one of the reasons they didn't have money was because of his economic mismanagement, which is kind of like expected from a guy with no education. So that was the most ironic part about living here at that time. You were uh, not getting food, but at the same time you're seeing this like massive, gigantic building that was being built for the elites. And not only was it being built, it was being built in the most inefficient way. Like you'd come every week and be like, oh no, I don't like these windows, I don't like these stairs, let's redo them. You're just wasting a lot of money on this building. One of the most interesting things here is that you can go to this church over there, a few hundred meters that way. And if you go to a church, it just looks like a normal church, you know, normal Orthodox church, uh, pretty one from the outside and everything. But then someone will tell you, this church used to be somewhere completely different. So this park where I'm at, this is where that church used to be back in the days. And it was moved from here. So they basically put that church on a train track and then like transported it to where it is today. Which is just crazy the amount of money that was wasted to do that and uh, the things they could have done with that money, like feeding the people. So as Ceausescu's policies became crazier and crazier, he became more and more totalitarian suppressing anyone that could have like opposing thoughts to his regime. He basically had an elaborate network of spies, similar to what uh, Hoxha had in Albania, to spy on people in day-to-day -day life and if anyone said something wrong to someone they would like end up interrogated, arrested. I actually knew a guy from Romania who said his dad's brother turned out to be a spy. That's how like deeply it was entrenched. So everyone was like living in fear the whole time. And he also had these like crazy goals 
that like made no sense. He wanted to double or at least like drastically increase Romania's population. So he started making crazy policies that would help him achieve that goal. He made it illegal for women to have contraception or abortions, which led to a massive rise in like very dangerous illegal abortions and which also led to a lot of orphans in orphanages which were kids that were not actually orphans their parents were alive but these were just kids whose parents had unplanned pregnancies and then did not have the money to raise their kids because no one in the country had any money and they ended up in orphanages so this was like a real big crisis because he was uh, not educated he had a lot of policies regarding mismanagement of the economy that made the country triple its debt in the 80s and in order to pay off this debt basically he started starving his people because it was communist everything like food and electricity and heating everything was controlled by the government so people started lacking like the basic necessities they wouldn't have hot water they wouldn't have heating to stay warm they were like getting rationed for food so they would have to like stand in line to get some food which was like always in limited supply often after waiting in line with these ration cards the country would run out of food and people would just go hungry so the sense of contempt was very high in the air people were impoverished people didn't have the basic necessities they didn't have the freedom to say anything against it so they were angry so I'm back in Revolution Square and now I'm going to tell you why this place was actually called Revolution Square because this is where it all went down. So in December 1989, people were fed up with communism and Ceausescu's rule and some protests broke out a week earlier in Timisoara, like a town on the western side of Romania where I was four years ago. His response to that was basically to shoot at the protesters which made people even more angry because dozens of people died in those shootings and he was trying to contain that to that part of the country and he did a speech in this building behind me right here which used to be the Communist Party's central committee back in the days and there was a balcony over here and this was the balcony from where he gave his famous speech in 1968 condemning the USSR for invading Czechoslovakia so this is where he reached the peak of his popularity and his goal was he's gonna come here and give a speech and like calm down the people that were looking for revolution but didn't quite go like that the speech was being televised on national TV he came out to the balcony and there was hundreds like a hundred thousand people in front of him minutes into the speech he noticed the crowd was chanting against him the protests had turned against him in the middle of his capital city. His bodyguard took him inside and the revolution broke out on the streets. And there were a lot of other revolutions against communism in Eastern Europe as all of this was coming down at the same time. But this was the only really bloody revolution where thousands of people died tanks were out on the streets like trampling protesters the government forces were shooting at the protesters the civil war being fought out on the streets of bucharest can have only one outcome the immense firepower of the army reinforced by the anger of ordinary people must soon overcome the bitter last ditch resistance of the ceausescu loyalists and ceausescu basically had to get on a helicopter and escape from the roof because his security couldn't keep up with the protesters. The next day his military basically turned against him and uh, captured him and uh, on 25th December 1989 on Christmas Day they actually televised this on national TV. There was a mock trial where he was charged for genocide and legal gathering of wealth and the outcome was already decided before the trial even started. He was about to be executed. Him and his wife Elena, his partner in crime, were taken outside the building this is not in Bucharest, this is like a few hours north of Bucharest and they were like executed by a firing squad. Ceausescu's life was over, communism in Romania was over with a few shots. Okay, so I came back to Old Town to finish off the video and tell you about the last chapter of Romania because it's night and this is the place to be at night and I uh, ordered a beer, I think an Ursus beer which is supposed to be like a popular Romanian beer or at least that's the uh, bartender told me <laughs> let's hope it is but uh, I want to talk about Romania after the communist era because to a large extent I think that was the end of the dark days for Romania and Bucharest as well so 
It wasn't like all smooth sailing. There were a couple of hiccups along the way. The population of Romania actually has shrank since independence in the last 34 years. So it's like less people than there used to be when um, the revolution happened. And that's partially because of a lot of people left to work in other countries, partially because of low birth rates and all that. Corruption has also still been a problem. Like the biggest politicians or some of the biggest politicians have been involved in some pretty damning scandals even in the last decade. But despite all of that, Romania's GDP or GDP per capita has like become 10 times or almost 10 times what it used to be when the revolution happened. So the economy has seen a massive boom and uh, people have really seen the country change into the prospering country with a very promising future that it is today. Now there are a couple of reasons why this economic boom happened. The first is the IT sector. The Romanian government invested heavily in education after the revolution but they invested even more heavily in IT education which led to Romania having the highest number of certified IT technicians per capita in all of Europe. Last time when I was here in Bucharest, when I went out to the bars, a lot of the people that I met were like at these fancy clubs, or not fancy clubs, but like seemed like they were doing pretty well. Uh, I was talking to them about what they do. A lot of them basically work for Western companies uh, and they work in IT. So they hire abroad in places like Romania because it's cheaper to hire there or here than it is, let's say, to hire somewhere in the US. So it's like a big win-win deal. They get higher wages than they would if they were working for a Romanian company. And a lot of that seems to happen over here. Something that I didn't know till very recently, because I was like looking up internet speed so I could like upload my videos and everything is that Romania actually has the fastest internet in Europe which is not something you automatically think of when you think about Romania the second reason that Romania did so well is because of its location for the bruiser thank you okay so this is the Ursus beer oh, this is so smooth it's like sweet got like a bit of a honey taste this is really nice actually but back to what I was saying remember how Romania was screwed over by all its neighbors because of its geography in the middle of these superpowers this location actually ended up paying off because now it's in the middle of like these very big economies countries with big economies in the east and countries with massive economies in Western Europe so because of this central location it's become a big business hub for, for cross-border trade and the final thing that helped Romania arguably almost as much as anything else if not more than anything else is joining the EU. Romania joined the EU in 2007 and got access to its massive 450 million people market. So that made uh, Romanian manufacturing very competitive and its manufacturing industry rapidly developed in the last couple of years. On top of that it received a lot of funding from the EU which also helped it like improve its infrastructure, improve its education and do like everything else it needs to do to become an advanced country. And finally, becoming a part of the EU made it a big uh, target for foreign investments, which further led to economic growth. So all of these things combined made Romania a pretty cool place. Um, there are some places, especially like rural areas, where there are people that are still struggling. But this is a different country than what it was in Ceausescu State. Some of the reasons why it became successful, you can attribute a lot. It has got some uh, big oil and gas reserves and its location is pretty ideal. But one of the big reasons that it became so successful after the revolution was the will of the people to go past the cold communism days, the hungry communism days, and uh, create a better future for themselves and everyone around them. That led to the policies that they had after that, that invested in the country's future and made it more self-sufficient. And that led to this prospering country of Romania that it is today, which has a bright future in the horizon and a really fun city like Bucharest with a lot of fun nightlife. All right, so that is it for this video from Bucharest. If you like this video, please do like it. If you want to watch more videos, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, feel free to follow me at Labir on the go. I'll catch you guys in the next video from I don't exactly know where, but it's going to be in Romania.